Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones is once again written and directed by George Lucas. And if you guys didn't know, I'm in the middle of covering every single Star Wars movie once a month until Episode 7 in December. That's including the Clone Wars animated film. Last month on May 4th, I reviewed Phantom Menace. You guys dug it. I'm back for more with Attack of the Clones. <laughs> yeah! <sighs> and just as a warning, just like with Phantom Menace, I'm going to be talking in detail here. So if you've never seen Attack of the Clones, I'm going to be spoiling some plot elements. And now you've been warned. Let's talk about this thing. So the blow that was Attack of the Clones was a little bit lessened simply because we had already seen Phantom Menace. So we sort of knew what to expect, but there was still a lot of fan anticipation going into this movie, hoping, just hoping that maybe Lucas had listened to some of the complaints with the first film. And in one small specific way he did, he lessened Jar Jar's involvement in this film a lot. He's in like one or two scenes. We'll talk more about him later. But for the most part, it's the same type of movie that Phantom Menace was. A gigantic green screen, blue screen disaster with even worse dialogue. My lady, so sorry. What most people expected episode two to be about was Anakin getting darker, closer to that dark side, discovering that evil side of him. But it's really just a romance. He runs into Padme and they fall in love together. And that's essentially what Attack of the Clones is about. Now, one of my biggest complaints with The Phantom Menace was that the Jedi Council didn't do anything. They just sat around in a room and talked while everyone else did all the hard stuff. Now, in the first scene in the film, there's an attempt on Padme's life and her decoy gets blown up. Now, she suspects that Count Dooku is behind this assassination attempt and Mace Windu instantly denies this, saying, he was once a Jedi. He says it's just not in Dooku's character to commit a crime like that. Now let me get this straight. If Dooku was once a Jedi, does that mean that you can suddenly not be a Jedi and just kind of quit being a Jedi? If that were so, wouldn't that mean that your ideals have changed and that maybe it is in his character to be bad? Mace Windu? all-powerful Jedi, who's really fucking dumb. One of the things that really bothered me about episode one and episode two was the casting choices made by George Lucas for the character of Anakin. Let's face it, Jake Lloyd was awful, and once again, Hayden Christensen is terrible. But I don't know who to blame. Is it the script? Is it the actors? Is it both? What is it? But I've been told that I have some rare footage. Apparently my crack team of me has discovered footage of George Lucas discovering Hayden Christensen. Let's observe. Let's decide, maybe there's a happy tree. <laughs> uh, oh, a little happy trees, right yes. Hmm, huh, who's this kid? You guys are, are pulling something. I like his look. Aren't you? Uh, oh, come on, I mean... When I was pretending to be afraid of the dummies, I, I did a much better job than that. Wow, I'm so taken by his acting ability. I, I thought that was just your dad playing a trick. Dad wouldn't do that to you. Well, maybe he did it by accident, you, you know, hit a wrong lever or, or something. I sense dark and unrest on this boy. Could he now. be my Anakin? Someone really needs to call the production team of the show and tell them to replace that dummy with CGI. No, I'm, I'm not falling for it. I, I don't believe it. Here, watch this. Come on, slappy old buddy old pal. Oh, look at how he so beautifully antagonizes that dummy. Names. Here, kick me again. Kick me, come on. I dare you. Oh, he seems to be perfectly encapsulating the angst well, of being a child. How Oh my god, yes. You didn't say please. <laughs> Goosebumps kid for Anakin. Bye Zane. See ya. Haha, <laughs> yes, that's my Anakin. I'll be seeing you real soon. Look at that evil stare. I'm loving it. <laughs> oh boy, I can't wait to start writing this. But first, I need to approve the new FX added to the special editions. Oh boy, I hope they got that cantina scene right. You know what the funny thing is? His acting really hasn't gotten that better since Night of the Living Dummy Part 3 on the Goosebumps TV show. 
Oh boy. <clears throat> so anyway, this assassin is after Padme and rather than just fill her room with gas as she's sleeping or shoot her or something, a little droid cuts holes into the glass and drops worms like into her room? Killer worms? Worst assassin ever! I mean, worms? What? Anakin and Obi-Wan stop these worms just in time, which leads to a chase. The chase is okay, even though it's like this glossy, video game-like CGI environment that you just can't really take seriously. And there's a part where Anakin jumps out of a car and Obi-Wan is like, I hate when he does that. I mean, does that happen a lot where Anakin just jumps out of cars from like really high places, plummets down Coruscant and lands perfectly on the enemy vehicle? Is that what Obi-Wan hates that he does? Like, what, is, what does that actually mean? This chase eventually leads them to a Moss Eisley Cantina-like club. There's one really good scene in here where Obi-Wan Jedi mind tricks a guy to stop being addicted to death sticks, whatever those are. That was a good scene. I like that. Once they capture this assassin, she is just about to tell them who hired her, and a toxic dart gets into her neck, and Jango Fett blasts off from really far away. Now, if this guy is so on top of things that he can shoot this girl from however many yards away, why didn't he just assassinate Padme? I guarantee if Jango Fett had been in there, he wouldn't have used worms. <laughs> The scenes that follow show us that George Lucas is using the same technique he did in Phantom Menace to give us information. People are just walking around in boring blue screen rooms in which they give us exposition and things we need to know. That's all it is. Just a whole bunch of scenes of people walking around going, oh yes, yes. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, what's this all about? Hmm. Well, I heard that there was a planet there once, but it seems to be struck from the records. I don't understand this. Yoda and these younglings, please show us. The oh, you did it magically. Thank you very much. That's, that's very helpful. But if there's just one thing that Lucas should have gotten right with this movie, it's the deep, dark unrest that's boiling inside of the character of Anakin. But he seems to confuse that with being a whiny brat, because that's all Anakin is in this entire movie. A constant, never-ending complainer. He's overly critical. He never listens. He, he doesn't understand. It's not fair. Obi-Wan never lets me do this. Obi-Wan never lets me do that. Also in this film, Anakin has major creeper face. Like every time Padme's nearby, the guy looks like he's about to assault her. So Obi-Wan then sends Anakin on a journey with Padme to protect her alone. Now, Jedi's apparently are forbidden to love as this idea was introduced in Attack of the Clones. Jedi's can never bang. They can't, they no, no love. That's bad. So how are they supposed to fucking procreate? Like what, what does that mean? How do Jedi's procreate if they can't love? They just look for people to breed with? That's so dumb. How do you create more of your kind? You just find people and teach them, I guess. You can never have children though. Or maybe you're allowed to have children as long as you don't love your mate. <laughs> George Lucas, you're making everything awful with this writing. But we have to accept it because that's what George Lucas wrote. So Jedis are forbidden to love. So why would you send Anakin on basically the most romantic mission ever in which they have candlelight dinners and sit by the fireplace and talk and have picnics in the most beautiful romantic location you could possibly imagine? Oh, and of course, Padme changes her outfit in like every single scene and her outfits get increasingly more revealing as the film goes on to the point where she basically looks like an exotic dancer. She is asking for it from Anakin, but she's like, no, I can't do it because I'm a senator. Senators aren't allowed to do anything that's not senatorly. Also, if Anakin is trying to not attract attention to himself as being Padme's bodyguard, wouldn't he try to hide the Padawan braid that he has that shows that he's still training under a Jedi? <laughs> So Obi-Wan makes it to this planet Kamino that he's been searching for. It seems to be almost entirely a water planet. It looks really cool. But when he gets there, he learns of a clone army that's been created under someone called Master Sypha Dyas, this plot that's introduced, that's never really explored again. Ever, actually. Somehow this clone army is being created with no one knowing about it. He just shows up at this random planet, they expect him, and now they have a clone army of CGI clone troopers that, by the way, are completely CGI, as just stated. Not a single human clone trooper was used in this movie. Not one. And I cannot go without mentioning the next scene which contains possibly the most stilted romantic dialogue these ears have ever heard. I hate sand. 
It's rough and irritating. And it gets everywhere. What is with the accents and inflections in these people's voices in this movie? Now, similar to Anakin's growing dark feelings, another important thing that really needs to sell in this movie is the romance between Padme and Anakin. And it just doesn't because it's so stale. Their first kiss, there's no chemistry. And one of the reasons the kiss doesn't work is because never once in the film so far has Padme even remotely hinted at reciprocating Anakin's creeper love. And now Lucas can continues to prove how excellent he is at choosing child actors because he hired this person to play Boba Fett. Is your father here? Yep. May we see him? Sure. I don't even have the energy to go into that right now. I really don't. So Obi-Wan now reports some of his findings to Mace Windu and Yoda, who are still sitting around in a room doing nothing. I think it is time we inform the Senate that our ability to use the force is diminished. Now I do enjoy most things about the fight between Obi-Wan and Jango Fett. It's pretty cool, especially when Obi-Wan just jumps in the air and kicks Jango Fett like it's Mortal Kombat. <laughs> But the worst part of this scene, and I laugh every time, it's hilarious, is when Obi-Wan just keeps getting blown up over and over again. Like, explosions occur like right in front of him. No scarring of any kind, nothing, no injuries really. Explosions just keep occurring right in front of his face. And he just flies back like, oh, oh. <laughs> It's so good. There's funny moments in this fight, like where he says, oh, not good, and then gets dragged around. I mean, it's good stuff, mostly. So now Obi-Wan is following Boba and Jango Fett in their ship, and they're about to approach an asteroid field. Now, one of the things I love about this scene is the sound effect for the seismic charges, that bound, like it's a great sound effect. I've loved it ever since I first saw the movie. But what I hate about this scene is they're now entering an asteroid field, okay? Two little ships going into an asteroid field. What other Star Wars movie had an asteroid field scene? That would be The Empire Strikes Back. Do you remember how they set up that scene? Do you remember how everyone was terrified? How Han and Leia were like, I don't know about this, this is a horrible idea. They'd be crazy to follow us, wouldn't they? And C-3PO's like, sir, sir, the odds of surviving an asteroid field, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, never tell me the odds. And they go into the asteroid field and that tension is built up because they set it up as a scary event, something that is hard to do, that requires a lot of skill. What happens in episode two? There's asteroids, they're going inside of them. No tension, no suspense, no buildup, nothing. Just let's fly in the asteroid field. We can do it, we're perfect. So Anakin starts having these nightmares about his mother being in pain. He says that Jedi don't have nightmares, apparently. Why, I mean, why can't Jedi have nightmares? It's like Lucas spent 30 years trying to think of all the things that Jedi can and can't do. Because they're not people, they're robots. They can't have love, they don't have nightmares, they just sit around in rooms and talk. That's what Jedis do. And rewatching this movie, right around here, I just want to turn it off. I don't want to watch it anymore. I'm d I don't want to, I'm done. I, I don't, but I sat there and I watched the rest of the movie. We meet Count Dooku. Now this should have been a very dark and scary experience. Instead, we get this older gentleman sitting behind a table talking to people. That's Count Dooku. He's just like this cool guy who's nice older man, looks handsome, you know, it's behind the table, it's talking. That's Count Dooku. Now the best scene in the film by far is Anakin holding his dead mother in his arms as she dies. His anger, the explosion against the Tusken Raiders. It's great stuff. Lucas really captured that really well, but it's cut short. It's too short. The scene ends. It seems like they were still trying to go for that PG rating, which was very unfortunate because that scene it was like, okay, you got me. You got, oh, it's over. Okay. But the sight of Anakin carrying his dead mother conveys the pain of his loss very well. Lucas did a really good job with that aspect of the movie. But he also undoes some of that effectiveness with the next scene in which Hayden Christensen delivers his lines about how much he hates Tusken Raiders and about how they're animals. And I slaughter them like animals. But not just the men, but the women and the children too. I hate them.
So Obi-Wan is captured by Count Dooku, who then tells Obi-Wan that Darth Sidious is controlling the Senate. And Obi-Wan's like, no, no, no. My buddies on the Jedi Council would totally be aware of that. Trust me, Kenobi. Not these guys. No, they're, they're dumb. And if you thought the Senate meeting scenes were unbearable in The Phantom Menace, this time around we get to see Jar Jar involved in them. And he gives emergency powers to Palpatine. You know what that means? Jar Jar Binks, the little fucking rabbit, is basically responsible for the downfall of the Jedi and the rise of the Empire. Thank you, Lucas. You know what you're doing. You really know what you're doing, don't ya? You really had that one in mind, didn't ya? He just wanted to drive that in a little deeper. Just a little deeper in there with the Jar Jar. So we get to the conveyor belt scene, which basically just looks like Anakin twirling his lightsaber around in some kind of dance move. For the majority of the scene, Padme is stuck in a barrel somewhere, while Anakin twirls his lightsaber around against CGI robots and strange things. Now apparently Lucas actually came up with this scene at the very last second and kind of shot it on the fly. Now Spielberg did something very similar with the plane fight sequence in Raiders of the Lost Ark, but that scene worked because of its simplicity. This scene just has way too much stuff going on, and it basically just looks like two people dodging a bunch of CGI elements. If you want to see a good conveyor belt scene, check out Minority Report. Oddly, they both have moments in which our hero gets his arm caught in something, and they both came out in 2002. And Steven Spielberg and George Lucas are friends. Connections? Now we finally get the scene in which Padme confesses her love to Anakin by saying, I truly, deeply love you. Because that's what people say to people who they're in love with. And of course, rather than just killing them while they have them captured, they set up this elaborate gladiator-like battlefield in which they are forced to fight against various creatures. Now, some of this scene works really well. I like how there's not a lot of music at first. There's some good humor there, but it's kind of stupid how the only injury in this scene is purposely just made to Padme to reveal her belly because she's supposed to be sexy in this one. So finally, we get some kind of something happening. A whole bunch of Jedi just decide, you know what? hey, we should probably contribute because there's like 500 of us and we should probably do something. I mean, finally. And Lucas continues his tradition of killing off Fett characters in very abrupt ways when Mace Windu cuts off Jango Fett's head. And he just had to put 3PO's head on a robot body throughout this scene. You know, for comic relief. To be completely honest, my fondest memories of this scene don't even involve the movie. They involve the game Star Wars The Clone Wars which I enjoyed playing. And when young Boba Fett picks up Jango's head, I always just expected his head to just go like plop, like right out from the helmet. I mean, that's where his head is, right? He cut off his head. The head didn't roll out of the helmet. It's in the helmet. Shouldn't it just kind of fall out and be like this horrific thing? <laughs> the kid just go plop. Oh, that's my dad's head. Oh, I'm gonna be evil and avenge him. As I was watching this movie, slowly but surely, I began to think I was watching Who Framed Roger Rabbit. You know, a movie in which real people interact with cartoons. Cause seeing Mace Windu in this blue screen environment just flailing his purple lightsaber everywhere and then talking to a floating CGI Yoda and looking at creatures that don't exist. I'm just like, is this really just a cartoon with some real people in there every once in a while? And next we get what is hands down the worst lightsaber fight in the entire saga. Even if there wasn't anything of real internal emotional conflict going on in the Phantom Menace fight, it was at least really cool to look at with good choreography and Darth Maul. This one has all these awkward shots of them just twirling lightsabers above their heads, close-ups and this strange attempt at some kind of art film moment. And of course the obvious Count Dooku stunt double. Now Yoda shows up, let's talk about that. He takes his lightsaber, he starts jumping around and flipping and everything and it's nuts. People loved it for some reason. Some people really liked that scene. I don't know why. It's one of the dumbest moments in the entire saga. What does Yoda say in The Empire Strikes Back? He says the Force is not about muscle. This crude matter here. No, it's not about that. Remember that? It's not about your lightsaber. It's not about flailing around. It's not about doing fucking barrel rolls in the air. Do a barrel roll. Do a barrel roll. Use the boost to chase. Use the boost to get through. You're becoming a better pilot. So Anakin and Padme get married, the end. Yeesh. 
To be completely honest, Attack of the Clones is actually my least favorite film in the entire saga. Yes, it doesn't have as much Jar Jar, and yes, Jake Lloyd isn't in it, but it's replaced with another person who's horrible as Anakin as well. And at least Phantom Menace didn't have any of that awkward, cringeworthy, romantic dialogue, and it at least had Darth Maul as well. This doesn't even have Darth Maul, the lightsaber fight doesn't even work. Nothing about Attack of the Clones works. That being said, you can still watch it as a Star Wars movie. I'm gonna give it the same grade that I gave Phantom Menace, even though I like it less. Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones gets a C minus. Also, I wanna give a huge thank you to Piot Michael for helping me out with his brilliant George Lucas impersonation. I was so thrilled when he said he would help with this video. Here's a presentation from him. You have just experienced an impression by Piot Michael. That's right, I did the impression of George Lucas, and I had fun collaborating with Chris. If you enjoyed that impression, head on over to my channel, Poke de Chef, P-O-K-E-D-A-C-H-E-F, and you'll see a whole bunch of other impressions. I guarantee it. Over here, I've uh, sort of been stuck my eyes. <laughs> so guys, I hope you enjoyed my review of episode two. I'm going to be back next month with my review of episode three. And if you missed my review of Phantom Menace, that's on my channel right now. Guys, thank you so much as always for watching. And if you like this, you can click right here and get stuck manized.